What if I told you there is a cloud accounting ERP system that has over 5 million users worldwide, and this ERP system only has one accounting firm listed in their find an accountant directory for all of North America? I'm guessing you're thinking, it sounds like an opportunity to get new clients and grow your firm. Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, Odoo, later in the episode. More businesses were created in 2020 than since any year uh, since 2004. And it makes total sense. People are at home. They've got time on their hands. They're reevaluating their lives and what they want to do. And a lot of them are saying, you know what? I don't want to go back to the office. I like this. I want to work for myself. I'm going to start a business. And this is why accountants and bookkeepers have more work than they can possibly ever handle. It's a great time to be an accountant or a bookkeeper. It's a great time if you are working in corporate to go leave your job and start a firm because, like you said, David, there's just millions of small businesses brand new out there looking for bookkeeping help, tax help, CFO advisory, everything. It's great. And you can help any of them without becoming a CPA. (laughs) (laughs) Full circle on that that note. We should end on that note. Today is Friday, July 2nd. This is the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. Blake, hopefully our listeners notice my recording studio is a little bit better. It's still not done. I hung pillows on the walls to help with the echo a little bit, but maybe next time it'll be really, really great. I am very fortunate to have an amazing studio. I am literally in a recording studio right now. I'm You are? In, I am, yes. I'm, I'm in Los Angeles visiting my in-laws. Oh, you went big here. time, big time. And my father-in-law uh, is retired now, but he was a TV and film composer. So I'm sitting in his recording studio in his house and he has professional sound treatment all over the walls, beautiful studio monitors, piano, everything. All right. We'll both take pictures and you can do a side-by-side of our studios <laughs> for this episode. <laughs> so the heat of Phoenix just finally you, it broke you. You're like, I'm out. I have to go to LA. I had to get out for, for a month at least. Yeah. Although, you know, it's funny because we're going to Seattle after this. And uh, <laughs> I was joking with my parents who are up in Seattle that they should come back to Phoenix because they could cool off. I think I saw Vancouver yeah. was hotter than Phoenix. I'm like, how is that even possible? It was like a once in a century kind of like heat thing. It was like 100 and I don't know. It was insane. It was hotter than Phoenix was a few weeks ago. Anyway, we've got a lot of hot news to get to this week. So we should probably uh, jump into it. Before that, though, I have a story about going out to dinner here in L.A last night. So I'm out to dinner with my wife, with Samantha, and we're at this Italian restaurant that we love that we haven't been to in a year. Do they have pizza there? Yeah, they have pizza. All right. All right good. Cause I have the next story now. I okay. Continue on. <laughs> okay. So we'll transition into pizza after this, but, uh, so we're out at dinner and they are clearly understaffed, but this is every restaurant everywhere. It does not have enough people people working right now, and they're all trying to hire. And so the waiter is doing his best. He's running around and taking orders, but it's taken a while. We're happy, though. We're just happy to be out. No kid. And at the end of the meal, I get the check. And on the receipt, on the on the bill, there is a QR code at the bottom. Now, I've started seeing these crop up, and usually it's... Uh, like a promotional thing. But I noticed that on this QR code, it said, scan this code to pay with your phone. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. And since we had a lot of time, I didn't think he would be coming back anytime soon. I said, I'll I'll give this a try. So I opened up my photos app or my camera app on my iPhone. I just pointed it at the QR code. And all of a sudden, magically, Apple Pay opens up with a copy of the bill in Apple Pay. I've never seen anything like this before. Was this via? Was the receipt via Toast? Who was the uh, the URL? The QR yes. code. Yes. So toast. Okay. Yep. it was a little pop up. It said "Pay for check, Apple Pay using Toast," and then I I swipe I swiped up, and then it showed me the detailed bill, just like on the piece of paper, and the total, and the option to tip, and it had the pre configured, you know, ten, fifteen, twenty percent, and I could just tap what I wanted to tip, and then it said "Pay via Apple Pay," and I just double clicked on the side button. And it used my credit card and file, and I paid. It's convenient. I've done this once before at a restaurant. It is pretty convenient. And I don't even have an iPhone. 
and it, and it was it was a nice experience. Uh, but I also got an interesting experience at a new restaurant that the wife and I went to here in Tucson. Okay. So it's a fairly new restaurant. It's set up. I got the receipt with the barcode, and the restaurant owner said, "Don't pay with that, please." <laughs> Why? Because so, you know, a lot of how merchant service works, right? There's a guy, they set it up and that guy who sits at the merchant service kind of gets a piece of the action. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently when people pay through the barcode on the receipts, there's a, more of a fee for the restaurant. Oh. So what's happened is the merchant service guys are just turning this on for restaurants by default, even the restaurant owner doesn't want it. And then they don't have to pay the extra fees when they could just walk over and swipe your card for you or bring you the machine, let you do a chip, a chip and pin. Oh, and so, so it's kind of interesting. Rest, so a lot of restaurants are like, they're getting charged more to offer this. Now, my understanding though, if you're a busy restaurant, you'll flip tables faster because you, right. you can just scan and get the hell out of the restaurant. And then I can see my next guest and sell them fresh food. So at high volume, I think you want that, but at other restaurants, maybe it doesn't make sense, but well, it's it really, really funny. Same experience. It's just the restaurant was like, don't scan your, don't scan the receipt. I'll just take your card. It, it, that's interesting. And this was was this the toast point of sale or was this something else? It was else? toast as well. Yes, it was oh, toast. Oh, yep. interesting. So they may be paying extra fee. So think about it though. It might be worth it depending on what the fee is because it can take 10 minutes, even 15 minutes just to bring the check for the customer to put down the credit card, then to take that back, to swipe it, then to take that back to the customer. So if you multiply that by the number of tables you're turning over all, every night, you could save – hours potentially and that's wages right so this is the reason i brought this up is because this is one of those silver linings of the pandemic in that we're finally starting to use technology that is ancient qr codes were developed yes. in like the 90s and they have so much potential and now they're finally being used for contactless payments and to speed up transactions and we should have been doing this a long time ago, but we didn't have any pressure because we didn't have you know, pressure on wages, right? It was an employer's market. Now it's an employee's job market. And so employers are going to have to figure out how to be more efficient. And this is good for consumers because now we're not sitting around waiting. And to tie this into what accountants do, like let's be thinking about how we can make payments and transactions and all this stuff that normally is really tedious, easier for our customers. I mean, maybe even include on your invoice a QR code so that people can pay with their phone. Most people have a credit card linked up to their phone. So if you have a QR code that just you know takes them and, and integrates with Apple Pay or Google Pay or whatever, or even just sends them to a website where they can just type in and pay, that is often the easiest thing. Well, I, I think it's even for firms to think about it a different way. If you compare the restaurant experience I had with that restaurant owner, he was worried about his 2% or whatever extra 1% that was going to be on the bill. Yeah. And not worried about maybe my experience, right? And you got the better, you were, you had a delightful experience. You're like, this is amazing, right? So it's kind of like that, you know, we, people were complaining about $10 price difference in QuickBooks, right? Or, mm -hmm. and I'll see accountants complain about, you know, for their own billing of clients, the merchant service fees, right? <laughs> Things like that. Yeah. And it's almost like, well, maybe the focus should be not on, you know, $10 here, $15 here. And the focus should be on, did I give my client a $200 experience, but it cost me $15. And, and that's a really good point. We still have a big problem in our profession, just getting firms to accept credit cards because they don't want to pay the fee. And I'm always talking to firm owners and saying, guys, look, two or 3% is well worth it to avoid the collections issues you have when you've got clients paying you by check or even ACH. And there's ways you can compromise on this. For instance, you could take the first payment when you work with a new client by credit card just to make it easy for them to sign up with you. And then once you take over their books and their payments, then you switch them to paying you by ACH. So you're not paying the fee going forward. Like that's a good compromise, right? Just make it super dumb easy for people to start working with you and pay you. The customer experience is the most important thing. Yeah, I always imagined a world where like if I sent out my QuickBooks invoice, Whoever got it would, you know, click on the 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 e link from the email and they would get a page with like five hundred payment buttons. Like like I don't care, like whatever you like to pay with, I want to accept the payment. Like that right. would be the dream. It would you know, it would be like like those old click websites where they'd have all those buttons on it in the old days, the ads, the pixel yeah, ads, and yeah, people would yeah. fill up a website with ten thousand ads. It would be like that, but all, but then people would find the payment button that they like and they would pay with how they want to pay. Choose a payment method, any payment method. Yeah, and they'd just be hundred of them, hundred payment buttons on the website it would be great. 
So we got another voicemail, David, and I love how we keep getting voicemails. I hope it continues. So I want to play this one and make sure that we get to it. This is follow-up to the whole conversation about barriers to entry in the CPA world, the cost of the exam, all that stuff. So here we go. Hey, what's up, guys? It's your buddy, Byron Patrick. Um, hey, I just had to call in on the, the CPA topic. Um, a couple of things. One, 100% agree we got to knock down the financial barriers. That should not be a barrier to entry for anyone who wants to become a CPA. But number two, and Blake, you, you said it, but I want to reinforce it. This isn't supposed to be easy. This is supposed to be uh, the best of the best. The, the people who have the grit to run the gauntlet, the knowledge, the foundation, the understanding to, you know, make sure that the right people are becoming certified public accountants. So this is not supposed to be easy. It is certainly not supposed to be a participation trophy. Not everybody's going to be able to, to get there. Um, and finally, uh, you know, I, I just, Everybody has their own unique story, but out of college, I had a newborn at home, a stay-at-home mom, and a full-time job starting my career when I was studying for the CPA exam. It was not easy. It was not like, you know, I didn't have the quote-unquote advantages um, that, you know, uh, someone who worked for themselves may have had. There's a lot of people who, you know, figured out how to do it. And I know if you want it enough, if you value it enough, you'll get there. But um, it, it's it you you have to get there, and it's not going to be everybody. Anyway, um, appreciate your time. Look forward to seeing you all soon. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Byron. Thank you for calling in and for your take on that. And I I agree. It shouldn't it shouldn't be easy. And I put a lot of weight in his opinion on this. Like, he, he not only did he use CPA, he got to be able to tattoo on his forearm that says CPA. That's so, true. like, he has a, he has like a, a different level than all other CPAs to speak on this. I think, <laughs> like, it was so valuable to him, and he put in all that work to do it that it, he tattooed it on his skin. Right. Well, like, it's something so important to him that can't be taken away. And this is part of the challenge in making it easier is that folks who had a hard time, who worked really hard, say, why should we make it easier for these youngins to get the CPA when I had to work harder for it? Yeah, you millennials. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I just have, I have an issue with this because just because there's a lot of red tape, I mean, all right, let me step back for a second. The whole point of it being difficult is that you want the most qualified people Right, that's the idea. Is you want to put up a barrier so that you get the best of the best. But I don't know if the barrier is really actually giving us the best. It might just be giving us the most determined. But does that mean you're really the most talented or the most skilled or you're going to be the best CPA? Just because there's a lot of red tape doesn't mean that's the case. And I find the exam actually to be a lot of that. Like the the exam is difficult, not necessarily because of what it tests, but because of the way it's structured. <laughs> and how long it is and how much it covers broadly. Uh, but, you know, did I, in studying for the exam, become a better accountant? I'm not really sure about that. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, are the barriers we are putting up actually getting better people into the profession? And it might actually be discouraging some of the brightest and the most talented people because they're like, well, I can go do something in technology where I don't face these regulations and I don't have to deal with this stuff and I'll go do that somebody, instead. Somebody like me who arguably maybe is a bright individual with some skill sets and I just saw the accounting, the CPA route, like too much of a headache. I was like, it's too much work. Right. And it's not work because I'm lazy. It's just a lot of work I didn't want to be doing, I guess. it's a, a lot of it is work that just doesn't make you better as an accountant, right? It's just It's just work. <laughs> so you're saying that there's a possibility all all the busy work and the red tape of this is actually discouraging some of the best people to become accountants. Yeah, I considered dropping it, right? I started my business while I was studying for the exam. And the only reason that I completed it is because I'd promised my partner in life that I would do it. And she is more into this kind of stuff than I am. She's more of a you know person who likes traditional 
career paths. And so if I wanted to like stay married, <laughs> you know, this was something that I needed to finish up on because I'd, I'd said I would do it. But I, you know, maybe if I, if I wasn't committed in that way, I wouldn't have done it. I would have said, screw this. I can just go do technology stuff and I don't need the CPA to do that. And I can make more money and have more fun. So anyway, just something to think about. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Dark Horse CPAs. Creating a CPA firm from scratch is hard. Scaling it is even harder, and doing it alone sucks. Let's face it, being a CPA and being an entrepreneur are two entirely different things. If you're currently at the management level at a CPA firm and you're considering either leaving public accounting or going out on your own, you've got to take a look at Dark Horse CPAs. At Dark Horse, you'll have everything you need to quickly build a profitable book of business. From training and coaching to leading edge technology and a supportive community who helps each other succeed, this is your best shot at a better career in public accounting. It's all the upside of opening up your own firm without the risks and responsibilities of owning the business. If you want to learn more about improving your accounting career with Dark Horse, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash darkhorse. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash D-A-R-K-H-O-R-S-E. Or catch them at their booth at AICPA Engage this month. Tying off of that, the uh, you never talked about pizza. You were going to talk about oh, pizza. Well, right? I'll, I'll, I'll say for app news, but I'll tie it back to pizza. Okay. It ties right back to your pizza story for sure. But there's a some t- talking about certifications, right? So the AICPA just uh, signaled strong support for a new bill that's being introduced in Congress, and it's a bipartisan bill, and it's called the Taxpayer Protection and Prepare Proficiency Act. And essentially, the main part of it is they want to reinstitute what existed in 2011, the Registered Tax Return Preparer Program. Apparently, that was let go. The court struck it down because the IRS didn't have the authority from Congress to implement that. So essentially, they want to they, – anybody who's being a paid returner, but if they're not signing, they want uh, control over this. And they want to be able to kick you out and remove your uh, preparer tax ID number. So they, they, want, they want control in, over the quality – of service taxpayers are getting in theory. And this is such a great topic to jump to from the whole CPA exam thing, because what do people think of when they think CPAs? They think tax generally. I, I, I bet you if you surveyed the general public and you say, what do CPAs do? They'd be like, my taxes. The guy does my taxes. 90% yeah. of the time, right? And yet anyone can prepare taxes in this country. There is The IRS has no way right now to control that. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So- you, th- you would think that the one thing that you know we we are known for that we are really known for among the general public would be something that is protected like maybe that would actually incentivize more people to go get the CPA knowing that they're going to be regulated and if they get the CPA then there's like an exemption and I think that is what the AICPA is advocating for here they are supporting this bill to regulate tax repairs but they are also saying if somebody is a licensed CPA, exempt them from the extra regulation you're going to implement. Yeah. And if you're an employee of an attorney, a CPO, or an enrolled agent, you, you're exempt from this as well. So that is, I think, welcome. It should be welcome anyway in our profession. I think it kind of makes sense, right? It, it, like if, if you're going to submit a tax return, that you should have some sort of ID of that you're the person that did it and you have some sort of ID number. Maybe, maybe you pass some sort of exam, a background check, something. Well, even yes. if there's no exam check, it's just tracking who did the return. So that way when a bunch like, oh, this guy, every return you had this mistake on it, they can contact somebody and say, stop making this mistake. Never mind fraud and all the other stuff. It's just knowing who did the return will help fix things in the returns. Well, I think there was some sort of stat that the vast majority of fraud is by tax preparers is perpetrated by, you know, unlicensed preparers. You know, somebody who just opens up, you know, Bob's tax shop down the street and just starts filing fraudulent returns. So this would this would help put up some barriers for them anyway. Speaking of the IRS, 
The taxpayer advocate has issued another report to Congress prodding the IRS to improve its service and reduce its backlog. I don't know if you have been paying attention, David, but I, I keep seeing stats coming out that you know there's tens of millions of tax returns that have not yet been processed. The backlog. They're just stacked this... up there. They opened the envelopes though, right? They, yeah. they took them out of the envelopes. I feel, so I've heard the number like 30 plus million returns are yet to be processed. In this article in Accounting Today uh, that summarizes the Taxpayer Advocates Report to Congress, they're talking about 16.8 million paper tax returns waiting to be processed and that only 7% of taxpayers were able to reach assistance when they called the IRS's accounts management phone lines recently. That's uh, You said 7%? 7% of taxpayers reached the IRS and got help. 15.8 million returns were suspended by the IRS during processing and required further review. This is part of the problem is that they have to manually review these because they don't have the computer systems in place to automatically handle some of these exceptions. On the 1040 line, which is the most frequently called IRS toll-free number, taxpayers made about 85 million calls, but only 3% actually reached a telephone assister. Imagine if people called your company, David, and, and they could only get to a person 3% of the time. Would that be acceptable? Well, if you call the Cloud Accounting Podcast, you go straight to voicemail, you don't get somebody. So it seems acceptable. <laughs> we're running our business this way. We're, we're, running, we're modeling our business after, after the, IRS. the IRS. But the IRS doesn't even let you leave. the same a, budget amount. That's our problem. They don't even let you uh, leave a voicemail there. Uh, at least we, we get back to you. Like we play it on the air and we, we offer our commentary. You can call us as much as you want. By the way, David, we should give out that number. I want the IRS. Hold on. I want the IRS to put up a voicemail and then they could just create a podcast sending out all the recordings people leave. Those would be those would be amazing to listen to. That number for our show is 202-695-1040. 202-695-1040. Give us a call. Let us know what you think about the CPA, IRS, or any of the topics we discuss on this show. Just let us know how you're doing. What you think? Even better, next time you're on hold with the IRS and one phone, call us on the other line and let us know you're on hold. I think I'm ready for app news. I got a lot. We have all kinds of app news this week. Let us jump in. Which story do you want to jump into first? I think there was a tale of two payroll companies this week. Well, yeah, Gusto. Gusto is going to offer pieces of its service to other companies via API. This sounds a lot like what was the company? Check? Uh, Check, who we talked about last week, and uh, the companies like Homebase are building on them. And and, and actually, I think it's it's very similar. Uh, what wasn't clear is it, if they're going to also offer a little bit of a UI embed, or is it just API calls? Let's, let's talk about what this actually is. So Gusto announced that it is going to offer part of its service via an API to external platforms. The product is called Gusto Embedded Payroll and will allow vertical SaaS companies to provide payroll support to their own customers. So is it is it is it fair to call this white labeled payroll? Well, it's I think it's both. They they say you can either build your own interface or you can implement uh, a turnkey experience. So for example, one of the products here is Zenmade. So Zenmade is software that if you have a house cleaning business, you would use this app, Zenmade. It's a niche app. Like a lot of the niche apps are going down this path. They're going to put Gusto in. So Zenmade would have two options. They could just make API calls and build payroll, the whole UI experience from scratch, or they could just pull in, almost drop in the Gusto into their app and maybe they change the colors to match and that's it. So it's kind of white labeled, but it's just, yeah, somebody, somebody using Zenmade probably won't know it's Gusto, but somewhere deep down, they'll get, you know, there'll be an email to somebody that says powered by Gusto, I'm yeah. sure. Like something like that would, would pop so up. So this is really exciting to me as a Zero user because Zero built its own payroll in the US years ago, then realized that the US is really hard to build payroll for and decided to sh- shelve that and partner with Gusto. And so it's always been a less than optimal experience if you're a zero user because you had to manage payroll in a separate app than zero, whereas QuickBooks Online offers integrated payroll right in another tab. So now zero, I hope they do this. I mean, they got to be doing this, right? They're gonna, they could add payroll again back as a tab, and it would just be a white labeled Gusto experience inside of zero, which would be so much better from a customer experience standpoint for the business owner to just only have to go to one place to do it. 
and and this could be every app, like you said, right? If it could be any SaaS app, a time tracking app could add payroll. Uh, accounting firms can add it to this. So so Bookkeeper three hundred and sixty Collective. We talked about Collective, right? Um, uh, Vigaro is a, a Vigaro is a uh, niche app. Uh, Zendu, I think they are one of those accounting firms with tech invoices to go, right? So all these apps, like the Timesheet app. It's interesting because I wonder how much I th- home. Uh, we talked about um, not home base. Um, the timesheet app that built on check last week. I blinked out on the name. Is it home base? Well, while you think of that, I would yeah. say this is, is like, if I were at a firm big enough to have a budget to build its own app, I would be doing that. And I would be embedding payroll into my firm's app using this because how great an experience would that be when you can say, oh yeah, you know, ABC CPA, we offer payroll and you can just download our app and and run payroll and you can communicate with us in it and we'll handle everything for you. So the the app that they mention here in this TechCrunch article that using Gusto right now is Squire, and they're a startup that makes software for barbershops. So if you're a barbershop, you sign up for Squire, and you can run payroll right in Squire that's powered by Gusto. And it's funny because – and we'll talk about this next article because it's Intuit payroll-related as well. So you preface this by saying a tale of two payroll companies. So what's the uh, what's the other story we got? So yeah, I preface this tale of two payroll companies. So Gusto released an API for their payroll. Intuit just did a deal with Equifax. So they're going to basically let, they're going to share their payroll data. So 1.4 million small businesses, probably anywhere between 12 to 14 million employees. Those paychecks and that payroll data is now going to be shared with Equifax. And this came out because a business owner got an email from Intuit business owner. Yes, they've started communicating about that. And this. it's going to be you have to opt out if you don't want the data shared. And that's Yeah. So what they're doing, so they're saying that this is going to be tied to an exciting and new free service that'll let millions of small business employees get easy access to employment income verification services when you apply for a loan or a line of credit. So you go to the bank, the bank's like, "Hey, give me your last seven pay stubs." They don't have to do that anymore. They'll just have access to that data. Um and you're right, but they do say that you have to opt out of this by July 31st, or you'll automatically be opted and in. It, it's the employer who has to opt out of this data sharing agreement, not the employee, right? That's so correct. How is this, um, how is this legal? Like in this era- a- ADP has been doing it for decades. So, so I'm an employee of a company and they use ADP or they use Intuit for payroll. I have no say over whether or not that payroll provider sends my private compensation information to a credit reporting agency? Like, how can that be legal in this era of everyone wants more privacy? That's allowed? I just, I find that crazy. I don't know. And the, the, what drives me crazy about this, I think at a bigger level, if I go back to my career, and I used to be on the Intuit payroll team. And this is probably circa 2007, 2008. At that time, I was building View My Paycheck. And there's two things I insisted Intuit do, the payroll. I, I was like, we need, we should offer a payroll API. We have the whole, I mean, Intuit has a whole payroll engine machine in Reno, Nevada, right? It's the, the payroll machine, right? That does all this payroll. And I'm like, well, we already have all of it. Just open it up to any developer anywhere in the world. And, the, and this is right when APIs were starting to take off, you know, and Intuit was built into a partner platform and all that. And I was like, we should just do a payroll API. You know, now it's you know, 12 years later and Gusto is doing a payroll API. And I'm just like, oh, Intuit could do that first. But then the other thing was when I was doing View My Paycheck, there was a lot of talk because really, ultimately, everybody hates Equifax. Uh, what are the other two? Credit reporting people. The whole the whole system. It's the three, the big three, the, the credit reporting agencies, right? The big three. And ultimately, Intuit, we always were talking like, Intuit could be the credit reporting agency. Like why they're getting in bed is beyond me because I always thought Intuit could just disrupt the credit reporting agencies because they have the real data. And and now it's just, I don't know, it's disappointing to see Intuit get in bed when they could have been the credit reporting agency. Well, what's scary about this is that Equifax is the company that had that giant data leak, <laughs> right? They got hacked and lost millions and ten everybody basically everybody's credit reporting information got hacked. And like so now we're gonna trust them. Intuit's gonna trust them with our paycheck information like it just seems like a disaster waiting to happen and some of this like i understand is also like trade and scratch your back stuff right and what i mean by that is you know TurboTax wants to pull data to make your tax returns easier and i'm not saying TurboTax pulls things from 
Equifax, but I think that's how these things kind of work. Like, all right, you you send us some of your data and we'll let you and people file their taxes, pull data from our systems. And I think there's a little of that scratch your back stuff that happens with these bigger companies. But you're right. Like, how can you, just the, the random employee at the bottom of the pile, have any control over your information? You can't, apparently. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Odoo. I was checking out Odoo the other day, and sure, it has all the typical features you would expect in a highly customizable cloud ERP system, including dozens of built-in modules and thousands of third-party apps. But one of the built-in app modules really caught my eyes. It's a spreadsheet, but not any spreadsheet. It's a spreadsheet that is built directly into the accounting system. By using Odoo's built-in spreadsheet module, you can model and manipulate your data and it instantly stays up to date without any exports or integrations. It's crazy powerful. Imagine a sales rep updating a projected sale amount in a CRM module and having instantly reflected in your spreadsheet. The accounting and invoicing modules are always free, so there's no reason not to give Odoo and the spreadsheet module a try today. Head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash Odoo. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash O-D-O-O. Unleash your growth potential with Odoo. Anyway, we were talking about Intuit, so let's talk about Zero. Zero has some updates for July 2021. Here's a rundown of the new features. We don't have Zero Peril in the US anymore, but our listeners abroad may enjoy this bit of news. Zero Me is the app for employees of zero based companies when they're using Zero Payroll. And this Zero Me app allows employees to access their pay slips, leave, and timesheets in one place. It's now included with Zero Payroll subscriptions in Australia, New Zealand, and the UK, and it's been refreshed. You can now Merge client records in Zero HQ. That's at a global record. You can now view contacts based on income and expenses globally. So they've combined the income by contact and expenses by contact reports into a single report. It's called the income and expenses by contact report. So you can see a snapshot of each contact based on the income and expense transactions for a chosen period. Interestingly, in South Africa, Zero now offers an end to end tax solution. They have the ability to prepare, store, and submit their VAT returns to SARS, that's the South African Revenue Service, from zero. I, I wish we had stuff like that in the US. You know, it's like zero is such a um, comprehensive solution elsewhere in the world, right? Like it has, they have tax preparation software. They have, like, that's why they're so big in Australia. Um, we just don't have that. Uh, and in the US, they've improved their balance sheet report. So now you can uh, view comparison periods by day, month, quarter, and year, side by side. You can filter by tracking category. Those are the updates for Zero for July. Service Titan. So Service Titan is a niche app. And then we'll lead from this to the pizza story, I guess, right, as well. Service Titan is a niche app. I think uh, they started out in the HVAC space and they've been growing. And I think we talked about a couple of weeks ago, they took like $500 million, right? And but what they've, and they have 100,000 contractors currently being used. So they, they went from starting out in the space of just, that was their family business, right, of HVAC and electrical and plumbing. And now they got into garage doors and then those types of things. Any field service business. Exactly. So they started building out. And so now they actually just purchased a company called Aspire. And that, that company deals with commercial landscapes. So if you, you know, you're Bank of America and you have 500 locations and somebody has to come and trim the trees every single location. So the companies that do that would use Aspire to manage that work. It's a um, landscaping. They have 50,000 users and $4 billion in uh, annualized transactions on its platform. So Service Titan is buying them and becoming even bigger. And so now Service Titan is now valued at $9.5 billion. Wow. It's a niche app. A niche app. Well, field service management, I, I mean, we can call it niche, but like it's a pretty broad <laughs> industry or so, set, set of businesses. But this is the next thing because Service Titan, remember last week we talked about check. Service Titan's adding their own payroll built on checks, yeah. APIs. Well, ulti- right? And so that's where that march is happening. Every niche app is going to have payroll. So from the perspective of the accountant with the GL, Service Titan is like an add-on. 
But from the perspective of the business owner, Service Titan is the main thing they work in, and Zero or the QuickBooks is the in. add-on. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. No, that's very, very yeah. true. Very, very, very true. They don't even, they, and then to some extent, if you're on that, you could swap out zero QuickBooks and it would barely make an impact on their day to day business because yeah. it's just, it's just a teeny add on. It's just the GL, yep. right? It's not the function of the business. That's where the money's um, at. So, so we could stick with niche apps. So remember, we talked about Domino's, how Domino's was not using any of these uh, third party delivery services. And because of that, they own their data. They were able to grow their pizza business by 100% million dollars yeah, or a billion dollars. Yeah. I don't know. It's super efficient dominoes like dominated. And a lot of it is they have that app, right? And you can like see them put pepperoni on your pizza and it goes to the oven with a camera. I don't know. So, it's like crazy. So apparently though, I heard, I heard a rumor that that's all like fake, that they don't actually have any way of, oh, really? yeah, yeah. It's all just an illusion. They don't have a way of measuring like the progress of the pizza through the store. Think about it. Like what? <laughs> You think that a Domino's store has like a tracking system in it that can like track every individual pizza? No, they're just, they're just aggr- There's a little RFID <laughs> in the crust, every piece of crust. Right? It's all an illusion, but it makes the customer feel good about it. Right. But, but what they did invest in is that app. So they don't have to rely on Uber and Grubhub and all that. And people know if yeah. I want a Domino's pizza, I use the Domino's app. And it's very competitive. Like people just pull out the app, they order pizza and they're done. Well, there's a, another niche app called Slice. And Slice basically gives that same experience for 16,000 independent pizzerias yeah. across the country. And so they've just announced they've uh, expanding out. They have a Slice register, point of sale. And they're also adding Slice payments and they're adding Slice delivery management. So now you don't, you can do everything through this one app. You don't have to go, oh, I need to get Grubhub for the delivery and this thing and this thing. So they're letting you as the pizza shop owner own your entire stack of customer experience instead of having to depend on Uber and everybody else. So they're really basically letting independent pizza shops get that true Domino's stack where you own everything about your customer and you don't have to use third-party services. So the piece of this, which would be good for you maybe, Blake, is I know just found another article about Slice on a completely different website. It's a Thrillist or something. It has nothing to do with our space. I never read it. But they are looking for a resident head of pizza in every single state. So if you get the app and you order pizza through it, you can, you get entered in a, a contest. I don't know, maybe you get more entries, more pizzas. And they're going to announce, you have till July 30th, mid-August, they're going to announce 50 people who will be representatives of the, what do they call it? The P period I period E period society. The so pie society. The pie society. <laughs> and you get, you get a year supply of pizza, $1,300. And you get to try out a new pizza spot every single week. Plus, they give you five hundred dollars in travel to travel to pizza places and eat in your state. So it seems like a, a good gig if you can get it. I, I don't know, David. I've been trying to lose weight, so <laughs> this might not be compatible with that. Did you see LegalZoom went public? I saw that. Yeah, they were planning on it for a while. They they made it happen. And and LegalZoom made the podcast a few months ago because they're adding a bookkeeping service. They are. And what was really funny about it is I saw the pictures of them at um, the NASDAQ, you know, ringing the bell, you know, having their IPO. And it's a bunch of people from Intuit. It was really fun. It just, I actually think I made a comment on their official LinkedIn page. I was like, oh, look, it's like an all star team of Intuit employees because it's Rich Priest from the accountants. Mm -hmm. It was um, Dan Wienerkoff, who was the previous um, VP of QuickBooks at Intuit. Uh, the NG, the, CTO was a former engineer at Intuit. It's just the all, it's like an all-star team. Other biz dev person, I think she was at Intuit. So they've built out this whole team of Intuit people because I think they're betting a lot on their bookkeeping division. Canopy, the provider of cloud-based practice management technology for tax firms, has secured $11 million in a new round of funding on Tuesday. That included a new investor at Kona Capital, along with their early investors, New View Capital, Pelion Venture Partners, and Tenia Capital, among others. So far, Canopy has raised $101.5 million through eight rounds of funding, according to Crunchbase. They're going to use the extra money on product development and nothing specific. But I thought they kind of, I've read in the article that they were going to use it for their practice management software, they weren't going to try to work on the, oh, yeah. remember they tried to build a tax product? Yeah, you're right. So it is, it, I missed this. Practice management system is what they're going to build on. They want to enhance document management, CRM, client portal workflow, time and billing, payments, and invoicing. They are focusing on the 10 to 50 full-time employee segment. So firms with 10 to 50 employees. Large, you know, And this is actually, uh, the vast majority of firms have fewer than 10 employees. So they're working on the larger ones. 
Uh, and like you said, they originally were developing tax software, but abandoned that. I think everybody thinks they're going to develop tax software and then they find out it's a lot harder than they thought because the tax code is absurdly complex. Well, as soon as you just imagine you're trying to build it from scratch, every two week sprint, the tax code's changed. You have to redo the whole sprint over again. Like you've met, how do you how do you actually get it done? Is is beyond me. What I wonder is how do the people who you know created Turbo like how do the people at TurboTax update the software? I mean, it just must be a massive team that just tracks everything to try and keep it up to date. And a lot of times, like you said, the ground is changing underfoot. I, I mean, a lot of it was just. You had to build scale and systems, and it took 20 years, right, to probably build that all out eventually. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by AFO Wealth Management. AFO Wealth Management Forward was created to allow accounting firms to integrate wealth management services into their practice with ease. AFO Wealth Management Forward, powered by Arrowroot Family Office, provides a simple and easy way for accounting firms to integrate financial planning, estate planning, life insurance, and investment advisory into their current practice to increase recurring revenue streams without straining existing staff and resources. The program provides access to a robust online learning management system, one-on-one coaching, monthly Q&A sessions, webinars, and access to great partners, including Betterment, Vanilla Estate Planning, commission-free life insurance from DPL, and financial planning tools like Right Capital and eMoney. Learn how to easily adopt wealth management services through the power of technology and collaboration, and get 25% off when you mention the Cloud Accounting Podcast. Head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash AFO. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash AFO. Two other companies that built something out. Uh, There's a really good article in the New York Times about how Two apps basically did one third of all PPP loans this year. Two companies. The two companies are Womply, which I think we've mentioned before in some of our articles uh, or some of the previous PPP talk we've had mm-hmm. forever. But the other one is a company called Blue Acorn. And I find this one fascinating because Blue Acorn, well, Womply was a, a company that was old, they're a decade old company. Blue Acorn didn't even start until PPP was created. So they started in uh, April of 2020. They saw the, the the opportunity and created this basically a front end for people to apply for these loans. And does it say how much they issued in terms of loans? Because then we could get an idea of... Not that, but it talks about fees. So we know how much they earned in fees? So so Blue Acorn brought down probably approximately a billion dollars in fees wow. this year. So can you imagine starting a company last eight, eight, in April? 15 months ago? And you have a billion dollars in revenue already. And now, because they didn't even exist before the pandemic, which is just amazing. And what they've done is they've kind of worked through, some of it was just like technology and then advertising. So once they figured out they could offer these loans, they went after the Uber drivers. They went after all the lower end of the market that the banks, we've talked about this before, the banks were servicing. And they've done it so well that it brought down the average loan of the the entire offering across the whole PPP averages got brought down just because of these two companies. Amazing. It's like such a good example of how tech is just going to destroy the bank, traditional banking. And what really helped them was when they changed some of the, for the smaller loans, they changed some of the requirements when the government did that. And then this one, we somehow missed. A long time ago, early in PPP, we talked about the fees. Mm -hmm. So before the max you could earn on a loan was 5% of the loan's value. Right? Right, so right. the banks didn't want to touch it because on a $5,000 loan, they'd only make $250. But the government restructured this and now they can get 10 times as much. Really? So it's these guys figured out who how to pump these these applications through, get them to the banks. And they're taking 80, they're splitting this with the banks, 80, 20. Oh, wow. It's not even 50, 50. And so they, they've made a ton of money. Now, they, they, with that said, though, because of the volume and spinning up fast, they have had some issues. 
you know, there's been a lot of complaints online. Hey, I didn't get service. You can't do this. You can't get a hold of anybody. And they're actually arguing with a couple banks. A couple banks said that they were only going to be 80% on some of them and a different sharing percentage on the mm-hmm. others. And now Wampley's saying, nope, it's 80% on all loans. So they're starting to, they probably have some court battles over this. And there's a quote at the very end here. Two lenders said they would never work with Wampley again. At those rates, I'm in the hole and losing money on many of these loans. One lender even said, quote unquote, it's disturbing and it's disgusting. Oh, wow. The way the, 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 the balance, the 80-20, right? Speaking of disturbing, the Robinhood app that makes it easy to trade stock options on your phone and has gotten every 16-year-old into the stock market has agreed to pay seven, $70 million to settle a FINRA probe. It is the highest fine ever levied by FINRA, which regulates these types of companies, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. And they are not admitting wrongdoing to settle this. Uh, but a lot of this is around some deceptive practices, failure to exercise due diligence before approving customers to place options trades, failing to reasonably supervise their technology, resulting in those outages that users may recall that led to people losing a lot of money because they couldn't sell stock when they wanted to. Here's what's crazy about this. Even though this is the largest fine ever levied by FINRA, it's nothing compared to Robinhood's valuation. They're targeting a valuation of $40 billion in their IPO. And I think I saw something crazy that like they have like $81 billion in assets now that they're managing. And on top of that, they're going to try and sell their own stock in their own app, which I was thinking, well, if they get okay, the okay to do that, Square should do it. I mean, Intuit should do it. They should just, you get Intuit bank account, boom, you can convert some of that to Intuit stock. Oh like, my God. You know, it's just a great example of how tech is so outpacing the ability of regulators to regulate it. And even if they issue this fine, which is a large one for them. It's nothing for Robinhood. It's it's chump change for Robinhood. So I got one last app news story. This is a survey from Squarespace, the website builder. And the headline is amazing. Squarespace survey reveals Gen Z find digital life more important and memorable than in-person life. I have three teenagers and I fully agree. <laughs> I don't know a ton of Gen Zs. I, I think you know most most Gen Zs are like just twenty at old at the at the most, right? So or actually less, right? Teenage, they're still teenagers, a lot of them. So here's the t- big takeaway here, and the difference from Gen Z and and actually millennials fall into this too. So they 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 led with Gen Z because that's the juicy headline, but this also applies to millennials. So this is a big difference between Gen Z millennials and Gen X and especially boomers. So. 60% of Gen Z and 62% of millennials believe that how you present yourself online is more important than how you present yourself in person. That's compared to 38% of Gen X and 29% of baby boomers. Okay, so 60% or more of Gen Z and millennials think that how you present yourself online is more important than how you present yourself in person. And it's only like around 40% and 30% of baby boomers who of Gen X and baby boomers who agree with that. So that's a big change, a big shift, right? It's crazy to think that in this world, we have accountants and bookkeepers who don't have a website. Right? When how you present yourself in person is now more important than how you, pre- how you present yourself online is now more important than how you present yourself in person. Well, it kind of makes sense. Like I, I, if you want to go to my article that I have next, <laughs> it kind of explains a lot of this. Let's see it. Let's talk about it. Yeah, so uh, there was a study that came out, and accountants are more likely to re- return to the office and quote unquote back to normal than other professions. So they uh, a survey, and this was in accounting today, a survey of 500 managers, executives, senior leadership, and banking, financial planning, fintechs, financial accounting, and other related industries, that leaders at accounting firms were far more likely to be working full time at their firm's offices, and much more likely to keep their current office footprint and more likely predict that their employees will be all working full-time in their firm's office a year from now. So, well, why would you want a website and an online presence if everybody's going to be working in person face-to-face? And yet, and yet, David, one of the reasons that a lot of business owners and CEOs say that they want everyone back in the office is that it's those chance meetings in the hallways or at the water cooler that lead to innovation and the exchange of knowledge. But that's a myth. 
Here's a headline in the New York Times. Because it's happy hour in the beer. Yeah. That's where it happens. Do chance meetings at the office boost innovation? There's no evidence of it. And for some, the office even stifles creativity. Uh, so I, I encourage those of our listeners who are pro everybody back in the office, although I, I somehow doubt there are that many, take a look at this. It, it's It's really not true. There is no evidence that having people in the office leads to more creativity and in fact, it could be the opposite, that having people in the office, especially an open office, uh, leads to decreased interactions because people, in order to get work done, they put on their headphones and they put on their blinders and they don't look up from their desk because it's distracting. One study found that contemporary open offices led to 70% fewer face-to-face -face interactions for that reason. And I think that there's a Zoom fatigue. It is hard to be creative it's hard to be creative anywhere. Uh, and and working remotely requires you to structure that creative time, which is a challenge. You can't just like drop in on your employees and shoot the shit with them. Uh, but it can be done. And just because you, you haven't tried it doesn't mean it doesn't work. And so I, I don't know. I'm a big believer that you can be very creative working remotely, but you got to schedule the time, right? You got to schedule the brainstorming sessions. Uh, maybe Maybe you get people to go on a walk while they're doing a call instead of sitting at their desk. So I have an article that's kind of related to this working in person, but it's about meetings. And I don't think it's a great article. And that's why I wasn't going to bring on the show. But now that we're going down that path, it, might as well, it had some interesting stats. But the headline is 56% of employees believe too many meetings is affecting their job performance. Oh, I, yeah, that makes sense. And so in the 60s, you would only have 10 hours of meeting in, in, in a week. And then in 2017, it was 23 hours. And so it just keeps going up. 23 was hours, interesting. wow. 23 so hours. That's like half half your day in meetings. I, I'm beyond that. I'm not even gonna, it's embarrassing. Uh, what's interesting well, I, David, is, I want to dig into that. So like you spend a lot of time in meetings. Why do you spend so much time in meetings? So I'm in a weird role where I'm both internal and external facing. So I have internal meetings with fellow coworkers. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I'm having meetings with firm owners and accountants and bookkeepers externally. And so like I, I'm a little bit of an exception. It makes it a little hard, right? But but are those um, but are not... you productive in all of those meetings? Are those meetings actually necessary? Oh God, I want to kill myself sometimes though. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it, it, no, absolutely. It, it, but we're 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 I think the toughest part is is just scheduling. Like that's more I, for me, that's the hardest part of this is like how do you how do you how do you work in a global environment when you have people working all over the world these days and then and when it was in per when it was pre virtual, mm -hmm. maybe you just didn't have those meetings. You'd wait till they fly to the same country or something. You just didn't have those meetings. But now it's like expected. Like when we work for like yeah, like it's virtual. Just figure out your schedule and let's meet. And so it's 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 not only the number of meetings. It's the how many hours of the day do you, do you have this window of meetings? Because if you could just only do your eight, well, that means you're not going to be able to overlap with somebody and possibly in another geography. So I have a theory about this: the why there's so many meetings when we're working remotely. And this is just based on my personal experience, but I think it's because people tend to be lazy and it's easier to schedule a meeting. Like, so let's say you want to accomplish something. It's easier to just put a meeting on the calendar and say, all right, we're going to, we're going to do it. We're going to talk about it. And that, that, that is the forcing function. It's going to happen. Uh, and when, so they'll put an hour on the calendar with like half a dozen people when the whole thing probably could have been worked out in a Google Doc or an email exchange, but people are lazy and they don't want to type. I really think that a lot of people are slow at converting thoughts in their head into text on a page. Well, I think it's also tipped because it's like you need that time to sit down to just, okay, I'm going to write this up and write this doc. I'm going to do whatever that I'm going to do, but you can't seem to find three hours of quiet time because there's too many meetings to actually write it down. So you're just like, let's just have a meeting and talk it through because I don't have time to actually write it down somewhere. It's, it's, it's just, it's a horrible, vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle. It's a compounding problem because you have no time. So you just schedule more meetings. And so then your entire day is in meetings and you're not actually getting the work done that needs to get done. So here's some the scary part. So I'll read two stats and the really scary stat. So, you know, obviously with the pandemic, the increase now from January of 2020 to December of 2020, the increase of one-on-one -on -one virtual meetings is up more uh, 1,200%, which makes sense. Because if you were in person, we'd see each other in the hallway, we'd chat, but now we're doing a one-on-one. -on -one, right? But for group meetings, that rise in that was 613%. 
But this is the craziest stat of all of them. Virtual meetings still only account for 42% of all meetings. So, so even though virtual meetings are like through the roof, people are still spending uh, 58% on normal meetings. This is why this is why I could never like be an executive. I don't think <laughs> unless unless I'm the CEO, because I, I I feel like if you're a VP type level person, you spend your entire day in meetings, all day long. Yeah, you ever try to like get on their calendar? Yeah, exactly. And, like, there's there's no slot, and you go out like two weeks. There's just no slot. Yeah, yeah. I can't I can't handle that. Anyway, speaking of remote work, I got one more story that's kind of interesting. So this is about Colorado. Please be an up note, an up note, right? Let's be a, an up <laughs> well. Note. It's not. Sorry. Oh, so Colorado. Yeah. Melio, Melio's gonna. They just announced this week. Melio's gonna open their uh, second office in the U.S. in Colorado, in Denver. So I wonder they if, if you know, Melio is based in Tel Aviv in Israel. Maybe they haven't considered the consequences of opening an op- office in Colorado. Oh. <laughs> so Colorado has a state law that requires employers to disclose salaries for open positions. So if you post a job once you've got an office in Colorado, David, you're now going to have to on that job description, put a salary range, which most employers don't like doing because if you want to pay an advantageous salary for the employer, you want the employee to suggest the salary. That's interesting because, I mean, that that, that you're saying that because the press release article about this that I saw, it was put out by the Colorado government, actually talked about salaries of the jobs in the press release that was published on the Colorado government's website. Yeah, if you advertise a, a role in California, and you're you're a c- c- company with Nexus in Colorado, right? Even a few employees, you've got to exclo- disclose the expected salary or pay range for each open role you advertise, including remote positions. So is that only for the jobs that are in Colorado? No. So any any job Melio hires now throughout everywhere now has to disclose a salary, or they can get in trouble with Colorado. Yeah, because so, they, they, they actually put in the, the state of Colorado put data. They said the average sales and service positions salaries can be $82,000, which is 109% of Denver County's average annual, annual wage. And they said Colorado competed with Arizona, Nevada, and Texas. But I was actually – I was surprised that it had wage data in the press release from the state of Colorado. I mean, this is their press release. So the rule's aim – is to narrow gender wage gaps by providing greater transparency for employees. And here's... Okay, okay, I I get it, I get it. Makes sense. Here's the consequence, though. To avoid having to disclose that information, some employers seeking remote workers nationwide are saying that those living in Colorado need not apply. At Johnson & Johnson, roles recently posted for a commercial finance senior manager and a senior manager in operations include this caveat. Quote, work location is flexible if improved by the company, except that position may not be performed remotely from Colorado, unquote. Now, is this like they could still hire some from Colorado? They just, they're just saying the position is not open in Colorado, then they can bypass and get around the... I, I think it's... Like, so, so somebody from Colorado can still apply for the job and probably get it. But by just saying... But this is like the wink, wink text. Yeah. Like, wink, wink. Right. <laughs> All right. So, but Melio will not be able to get around that because they're going to have a physical presence there with an office there. So, yes, so now, yes. um, yeah, they're going to have, and it, it's interesting. Like, uh, this is one of those things where I'm really torn. Like, okay, it's, it puts an additional burden on the employer, but it increases transparency for the employees. I like it as an employee. I don't necessarily like it as an employer, but, and it, and it creates this weird situation with remote workers. So it's, it's basically causing an issue for people who want to work remotely from Colorado, because now they're seeing all these job postings that say, you can't, you can't apply for this job or you can apply, but we're not going to hire you if you want to work remotely in Colorado. And the problem is that if the company does hire you and you work remotely in Colorado, now they've definitely got to put up the um, salary ranges on all their jobs. So Johnson Johnson, big company, right? They're basically saying we are not going to hire any remote workers in Colorado because of this. To avoid having to disclose the salaries of every Johnson Johnson employee across every open job position, yeah. Wow. So this is creating a big, I think, could create a big problem for remote workers who want to move to Colorado and live in the mountains and you know have a nice quality of life. I mean, it was some a place I considered moving to when, <laughs> other than Arizona. So uh, it, it'd be interesting. Like if I guess if another state like California. Or New York did something like this, then uh, it would not be a problem anymore because the employers would just simply have to accept it. 
Uh, there was a, just to end on a really high, high note. So this article had uh, some stats in it because obviously this is from the state of Colorado and they're touting state of Colorado. But they said 98% of Colorado's businesses are small businesses. And 44,740 new businesses have been formed in the first quarter of 2021 alone. So think about, like, isn't it great? Like we we are in an industry, accounts and bookkeepers, servicing small businesses that like you have 44,000, just in the state of California, 44,000 new customers yeah. that didn't exist a quarter ago. Think about that. Like we live in an amazing uh, situation as accounts and bookkeepers. And I'm glad you brought this up because this isn't just a issue for that one state. All across the country, more businesses, I don't have the stat in front of me, but I saw this recently. More businesses were created in 2020 than since any year uh, since 2004. And it makes total sense. People are at home. They've got time on their hands. They're reevaluating their lives and what they want to do. And a lot of them are saying, you know what? I don't want to go back to the office. I like this. I want to work for myself. I'm going to start a business. And this is why accountants and bookkeepers have more work than they can possibly ever handle. It's a great time to be an accountant or a bookkeeper. And it's a great time if you are working in corporate to go leave your job and start a firm. Because like you said, David, there's just millions of small businesses brand new out there looking for bookkeeping help, tax help, CFO advisory, everything. It's great. And you can help any of them without becoming a CPA. <laughs> Full circle on that, on that note. We Boom. should end on that note. Done. David, if people want to reach you online, where's the best place for them to do that? Uh, any of the any of the interwebs, you can just find David Leary. At David Leary. If you're on LinkedIn, though, just say, I'm not a bot when you email me on LinkedIn. That way I can figure it out from the 10,000 bots. I am at Blake T. Oliver. Connect with me. Follow me on Twitter. Connect with me on LinkedIn. And if you want to leave a comment on any story we have discussed or really anything you're thinking about, give us a call, 202-695-1040. We love hearing from our listeners. And Blake, I get to see you maybe this week because I'm going to LA. I might see you this week. But then the week after that, I will see you in New Orleans at the Accounting Salon. And the week after that, I'll see you in Vegas at AICPA. So if any of you are at these events, come say hi. Yeah. In person, physical person. I'll bring t-shirts off Cloud Accounting Podcast t-shirts. This is like, I'm so excited. So excited. Yeah. We'll be at AICPA Engage at the RA in Las Vegas. If you're going to be there, uh, look us up, connect with us, let us know. We'd love to meet up with you. Talk to you next week, David. Bye. Time for the classifieds. If you're looking to fast track a scalable seven-figure accounting firm without having to work a million hours a week, check out Ryan Lozanis' online coaching membership, Future Firm Accelerate. The Future Firm Accelerate program is designed around Ryan's experience of taking his own cloud firm from scratch to sale so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You'll get online learning and topics that help you automate and systemize all aspects of your firm coaching when you need help with implementation, and you'll also join a collaborative community of hundreds of other forward-thinking accounting firm owners. For more details, head over to www.futurefirmaccelerate.com. That is futurefirmaccelerate.com. Are you an accountant or bookkeeper who wants to get the most out of Zero? Zero, a comprehensive guide for accountants and bookkeepers is available now. Author Amanda Aguilar shares eight years of experience using Xero in her own practice to connect the dots between accounting theory and software. See why Xero founder Rod Drury calls her a proven expert in getting the most out of the Xero platform and ecosystem. Buy it now on Amazon or through your local bookseller. I quickly wanted to let you know about a new project that I've been working on for the last year or so. I'm launching a podcast network called Accounting Podcast Network. It has new podcasts I know you'll love, like the Accounting Salon Conversations podcast hosted by Amanda Aguilar and the Accounting Automation Workflows podcast co-hosted by Brian Clare and Heather Satterley. Head over to accountingpodcastnetwork.com. That's accountingpodcastnetwork.com. Want to get the word out about your newsletter, webinar, party, Facebook group, podcast, ebook, job posting, or that fancy Excel macro you just created? Why not let the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast know by running a classified ad? Hit the show notes for the link to get more info. Whoop. <laughs> Drop the phone. The answering machine fell off the desk. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hold on. So much for that great recording studio. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's my music stand. Oh, we, you have to tell the story about the the music stand in your office because <laughs> I commented on how rickety it looked.
Well, it fell down and I had to take the monitor back to Costco. It broke. <laughs> I tell so you, that? you went to Costco and you're like, yeah, this monitor doesn't work. No, I sent my intern to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, take this back to Costco and get it exchanged for a new one. You put it in the amazing. box. Said the, the new work, got a new one. 